Stay tuned for tonight's adventure with the Fat Man. Okay, here we go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever time of day it is, I hope it's good to be where you are. Because I'm really excited to be here today. My name is Baltimore Fats, and there's a spy in the house of love. Yeah! All right, so allergies or long COVID or an imperfect presentation aside, the show must go on. So have fun, guys. All right, so we left off on magic with a question. What is it with all the Greco-Roman imagery in the 19th century? Right, And it's a question that I've been asking myself since episode one, when I looked into the statue of Orpheus at Starfort McHenry, right, which is a tribute to Francis Scott Key, author of the Star Spangled Banner, and, pun intended, key figure in Mud City, who someday will get his moment in the sun. And so it was after this that I really started paying attention to the classical architecture and statuary around Baltimore. And I did a fair bit of trespassing along the way, you know, climbing up this fire escape to get this shot was harrowing at best, right? And I'm here to tell you that I'm no closer to answering the question of as to why there was this obsession with Greco-Roman mythology in the 18th and 19th centuries. You know, the mainstream narrative plays it like it's just the result of the perfect storm of enlightenment. That interest then was at such a high because of all the wonderful things new sciences like archaeology were discovering, right? Along with a push of the classics into what was at this point the ever-expanding education market. And voila! Every architect is designing mini Parthenons for banks and government buildings and throwing Greco-Roman gods on the sides of everything else. And I'm just not buying it because of how it contrasts with the other side of the narrative that in the 18th and 19th centuries, the Western realm as we think of it today was littered with pious Christians, Quakers and Catholics and presbyters, oh my. And if I'm not mistaken, the first fucking commandment is thou shalt put no God before me, followed closely by not making false idols. Oops. You know, and I doubt that any artist or architect was shaking in their boots over God's wrath for designing these things. And Static did an excellent video about this that I'll plug here. Right? And he asks the same questions because it doesn't make sense. Right? And there are many possibilities as to why there was this obsession. Right? It could be as simple as the way Mud City and others as well see it that this is the hidden in plain sight truth that the ancient pagan religions are what our civic leaders were or are really worshiping. Right? But I don't know. You know. Something about this also feels a little too simple as well. Considering how easy it was for me to put together Mrs. Jarley's coven of Diana worshiping witches, like they wanted to be found. And so I think the why is always going to be something open to speculation. And it's more fun that way, but let's see if the juice can help us fill in some of the blanks because somebody somewhere may have had a glass or two too many and shed a little light on the subject. All right, so as I've mentioned briefly, the juice here is a publisher in his own right. And you know what he publishes? You guessed it, children's textbooks. And in 1814, he publishes this one, The Pantheon, or Ancient History of the Gods of Greece and Rome for the Use of Schools and Young Persons of Both Sexes. And I think this is interesting here, you know, showing an equality between what the sexes know or, or are taught at a very young age, right? And he wrote the majority of his children's books under the name William Baldwin for reasons we'll get into later. And right off the bat, he drops a bomb when he says that the purpose of this book is to place the heathen, the heathen mythology in two points of view. First, as it would have struck a traveler in Greece who wished to form a just conception of the religion of the country, free from either favor or prejudice. And the second purpose for this book is to regard mythology, and I love that he capitalizes mythology as the introduction and handmaid to the study of poetry. The author has endeavored to feel his subject in the spirit of a poet and communicate that feeling to others. So the purpose of teaching 19th century kids Greco-Roman mythology is to soften their minds for poetry and the other romantic arts. Right? It's a primer for romanticism. The new literary and artistic movement that had its peak from 1800 to 1850 and was characterized by its emphasis on emotion individualism, clandestine literature, and paganism. Right? And it was a movement spearheaded by the Jews and some of his friends, like Joseph Johnson, John Murray, Lord Byron, and Percy Shelley, 
his son-in-law. And trust me, it will never be lost on me that the root of poetry and poet, for that matter, is Poe, especially with the Byron and Poe families being so tight going back 400 plus years to Sherwood Forest. You know, I always have to keep that idea alive, right? And so in Mud City, romanticism is one of the most important tools our controllers used in building the identity politics nightmare. By creating an over-idealized sense of self-awareness and tying it to a pleasure principle like love or sex, the most powerful of all the pleasure principles, romanticism creates false expectations for long-term relationships. It can also distort one's sense of place in nature, and it can make one actually doubt the nature of their own happiness, the very thing that Juice believes every individual needs to achieve for the species to thrive. And so with Mud City taking its cues from Flat Earth and Mud Flood the way that it does, you know, with the idea that these things are hidden from us in a in an attempt to distance us from understanding our true nature, I think that idea gets a boost from the juice in his clear support of, I mean, downright pimping of romanticism. He admits to this right on the title page. He hopes to lead young minds to poetry. This book is to be the kid's handmaid that leads them there. And what appears on the surface to be innocuous, you know, love poems and whatnot, you know, in about 200 years, has all but destroyed how we as humans used to deal with the concepts of love and family. Right? In the U.S. alone, marriage rates have dropped almost 60% over the last 50 years. But that's okay. At least the divorce rate is down. Right? But could this have anything to do with the idea that it's impossible to keep up the standard romanticism sets? What started out as simple love poems evolved into novels and paintings and songs, movies, TV, creating an overwhelming presence of romanticist ideas. It's no wonder people are so disillusioned with marriage today. Not to mention all the artists who are so often encumbered by depression and substance abuse issues. And so the question is, is this the result of a natural progression or could this be the result of deliberate, if not sinister, intentions? And that's tough for me because I'll always consider myself a helpless romantic. But with the Mud City bias in play, it's hard to see this any other way. And I'm a poet and didn't know it. Right? And believe it or not, someone saw it coming back in the day. While digging around the juice, I found this amazing article in Romantic Circles, a refereed, and there's that word again, a refereed scholarly website devoted to the study of Romantic period literature and culture. And I love that their symbol is eight circles that form a non-traditional octagon with the way the octagon keeps popping up recently. And so anyway, they published this paper, The Radical Aesop. And this is a very interesting comparison because Aesop being the spreader of fables was also somebody who never existed. So could this be a subtle hint that William Godwin never existed? You know, I don't know. Right? But this article you know, called William Godwin and the Juvenile Library 1805 to 1825. Right, so before I reveal the bombshell information herein, let's set up how the Jews got to the juvenile library. Right, and this story starts with the death of his beloved baby mama, the Undertaker. If you recall, he wrote a posthumous memoir of his wife that proved quite scandalous, and it hurt his career. His reputation and social standing definitely took a hit. But that doesn't stop the Jews from taking a new wife. You know, so married life suited him after all, I guess. And so he marries his neighbor, Mary Jane Claremont. Right and here we have that Claire name again. Right, she was actually born Devile, which literally translates to calf or baby cow. You know, veal. Right, and she was from Devon because of course she was from Devon, and so that's another possible Poe connection there. And besides from becoming stepmom to young Mary and her half-sister Fanny, she has kids of her own, and her and the Juice actually push one out themselves, right? And so I wish I had more time to flesh out her and her family a little bit better, but apparently she has some experience as a children's bookseller, which is very interesting because that was a really new market at the time and a very specialized one. You know, because only sort of the wealthy could afford to have books for their children. And so with the help of their friends Joseph Johnson and John Murray, the couple opened their juvenile library, right? A bookstore seemingly set up solely to sell the books that they intend to write and publish, though they do publish others as well. And the juice is no dummy. He knows his associations in the world of radical politics 
will draw all kinds of red flags to his new children's publishing venture. So he registers the business to his buddy, little Tommy Hodgkins, who unfortunately can't keep his hands out of the till, so the juice has to give him the axe. And he re-registers the shop under his wife's name. And though while apparently Godwin was a common enough name back in the day, it was this act of hubris that caught the attention of a spy, because there were spies everywhere in London at this time. Right? And so one such anonymous tipster saw something and said something in 1813, warning the Home Office, which is Great Britain's intelligence agencies, right, warning the Home Office of the sedition coming out of the juvenile library. He warns that there appears to be a regular system to supersede all other elementary books and to make his library the resort of preparatory schools so that in time the principles of democracy and theophilanthropy, which is religious philanthropy, may take place universally. Right? This dude was downright prophetic because our society is falling apart as a result of these very things. Right? And not only this, but the spy also warns of the Jews' intention to corrupt the morality of the young with books like the Pantheon, which was introduced at the Charter House. Baldwin's mythology is an insidious and dangerous publication. It professes to exalt the purity and show the superiority of Christianity over the heathen morality taught in Grecian and Roman mythology. But then through the whole book, the juice improperly excites the curiosity of young persons and artfully hints the wisdom of the morality of the heathen world. I love that. He improperly excites the curiosity of young persons to the wisdom and morality of the heathen world. Right? And he also points out that the principal works that he, the juice, right, has published so far are a Grecian, a Roman, and an English history. So pretty much the history of the Western world, right? And in all of these, every democratic sentiment is printed in italics that they may not fail to present themselves to a child's notice. So in other words, giving these ideas a subliminal push, hoping to leave a lasting impression or imprint. Right? And this is important, of course, because democracies are designed to fail, right? As noted by the Journal of Democracy, whose days are clearly numbered. Right? And I love this Quara answer from this poster, whoever he is, right? He says that all forms of government fail for two simple reasons. One is that all human action is driven by self-interest. And while I certainly hope that's not true, it's certainly an idea promoted by the juice with his individual happiness rhetoric, right? And the second reason all governments fail is because there are too many stupid people out there, you know, people with low or average IQs, the ones being targeted, I mean nurtured, with all of this education reform set up by people like these guys, right? These low or average IQ individuals have a hard time differing gratification, thinking ahead, and seeing the, the unseen consequences of actions. And this combination will always cause people to vote themselves resources at the expense of others, which alienates the most productive who will in turn do less or outright stop working forcing economic collapse and social turmoil. That sounds exactly like what's going on today, right? The democratic algorithm at work, an algorithm put into motion by the juice and all his buddies. William Godwin and his juvenile library threatens nothing less than the government's worst fears about a political uprising, right? And the warnings of this spy or whoever he was go unheeded, of course, because the way Mud City sees it and the way it appears to be playing out before our very eyes is that the actions of the juice and his publishing friends does not represent the government's worst fears at all, but rather its wettest of dreams, right? Especially the way it's playing out 200 years later, because this spy wasn't just whistling Dixie. Some modern scholars have made this connection as well. Scholars like Pamela Clement, who argues that a regular system, more quotes, is discernible throughout Godwin's books. And she's talking about his children's books here. A system as much political and literary as it is educational. And this is a very interesting statement because his children's books are essentially ignored by most modern scholars today. Gee, I wonder why, right? But this spy also points out that the juice is aiding in the control of the English language by publishing a dictionary, Milius's School Dictionary of the English Language, a new guide to the English tongue. And this is the fifth edition with 15,000 copies recently sold. And so I have to wonder, is that the total for the four previous editions 
or just for the fourth edition alone. Because if this is an average per edition, that could mean there are some 75,000 copies of this dictionary out there at this point. And regardless, even 15,000 seems like a lot of copies for such a small press dictionary like this. And we've talked about spoken language being spellcraft a lot on this show. You know, it's a very popular topic covered by a lot of channels, right? And so, and so if this be true, what greater control can you exert over your populace than that of controlling the power of their speech? If they're unable to harness the full magic of the spoken word, the less likely they are to resist the power of your spoken words, right? And our spy understood this in 1813 or whenever it was, right? He writes the following about Milius's dictionary. Godwin has among his list Milius's dictionary, which has been inadvertently introduced into Christ's hospital. And I love this. Because how could something like a dictionary being introduced into a school, which is what Christ's hospital is, you know, how can that be done inadvertently? But anyway, our spy continues, it's a pocket dictionary, the danger of which consists in giving only one meaning to words which have several, and omitting all such words as philosophers of the present day do not like to explain. And man, would I love to know what words were removed. But what he's describing here is disabling the power of certain words by limiting their meaning. And the amazing thing about this concept is how it seems to revolve around the juice. Right? Remember, The Undertaker's childhood friend, Jane Gardner, published an English grammar book for young ladies in 1799. And then Magic's friend, Henry Leavitt Ellsworth, his traveling companion through the native frontier, right? his sister-in-law was Noah Webster's daughter. And let's not forget that Ellsworth was a twin, and Mud City spins it that they could have been one in the same, making Webster's daughter his wife. Wouldn't that be something, right? This dictionary game is like six degrees of Kevin Bacon charlied around the juice. And I doubt that that's a coincidence. There definitely seems to be a connection between the shaping of the modern English language and what is happening around William Godwin and all his chums that appears to be more nefarious than beneficial or altruistic. And sadly, I doubt those not afflicted with apophenia will ever recognize it. But I certainly hope that the connections I'm making here and others that I've made on this journey demonstrate that, that this work doesn't have to be the province of crazed, delusional, tinfoil hat-wearing, paranoid schizophrenics, but are things instead that open up to the critical mind. You know, that's the hope anyway. But regardless, to Mud City, the juice is the fuel, the primer to the false history and social programming that has so far contributed and culminated in this mess we have here today. And right, so before I close this one out, I just want to take a quick look through the Juice's bibliography. And I found this one on Archives, an online research center on the history and theory of anarchism. And unbelievably, this is not a complete bibliography. And I find some of its omissions very interesting, especially when it comes to his children's books. Like, they conveniently leave this one off the list, which is his first one. And it's called Bible Stories, Memorable Acts of the Ancient Patriarchs, Judges, and Kings, extracted from their original historians. And so I'm guessing those fictional biblical prophets, right, were the ori original historians, right? And this was published in 1802, before he opens up his juvenile library. This is the book that gives him the idea, right? And according to William St. Clair, and there's that Clair name again, Right. According to him, the book saw multiple reprints and was pirated in the United States. Right. So, a very intriguing omission from Archive. And when I read that the book had been pirated in the U.S., my mind went to two places. First, it went to my early video, There Is No Bible in Mud City, which is the story of how the modern Bible was cobbled together by an international multi-religious committee in response to the bootleg or pirate Bible trade, right? And that they copyrighted the Bible, right? Just the idea that the Juice's biblical history book and the Bible were both bootlegged in the U.S. struck me, right? And then the other place my mind went was to an idea that Mary shared with me regarding Francis Scott Key, the Baltimore Bible Society, and the idea that the Jesu Christo we know today wasn't the product of any Nicene Creed by Constantine, but was instead a product out of Balta Rome, right? It's Bible Society, the Basilica, the Keys, the Carols, you know? And I love this idea. And of course, Mary has some 40 plus years head start on me in Baltimore history, so it may be some time before I get to this story. Hopefully I will. But let's get back to the juice 
and the notion that he's a major contributor to the false paradigm enslaving us. Right? And, this, and his second book could be another example of false history with this biography of William Pitt the Elder, who was a recently deceased former prime minister and fellow of the Royal Society, who was best known for his work fighting those ne'er-do-well French and for his support of American independence in which the French were our ally, but I guess we'll work on that later, right? He was also known for his advocacy of British greatness, expansionism, and empire. How can you support both unless you know that one is the continuation of the other? You know, how much of what we know about William Pitt the Elder comes from this book? You know, I have no idea. And right? so continuing, 1797, he publishes that Inquirer, Reflections on Education, Manners, and Literature of which I've read from already. You know, and then it's this period as well that he's putting out his memoir on The Undertaker and so forth, right? And in 1804, he writes a combined biography of Chaucer and John of Gaunt, including sketches of the manners, opinions, arts, and literature of England in the 14th century. How many other contemporary to 1804 biographies like this are out there? How much of what we know about the medieval English arts comes from the juice? And it's from here we get into his juvenile library period, where we see perhaps his major contributions to the false historical narrative. And I could go on. He wrote a lot of books, but I think I'm going to wrap this one up here. And so I don't know how well I did answering the question posed at the beginning of this episode about, about why there's so much Greco-Roman influence in the 18th and 19th centuries, but having it as a primer for Romanticism and the other arts is a good start, I think, right? And I definitely feel that the juice was a major component, as evidenced by the cherry I'm about to put on top of this episode. And that's that I don't think there's any coincidence to the fact that William Godwin opens a juvenile library and the root of library is Liber, God of Freedom, and the Juice's namesake by another name. All right, that's all I have on this one. And so be sure to tune in for the next espionage-filled episode. Remember, guys, just because you don't know the truth doesn't mean you can't have fun with the lies. Until the next one, cheers. I'm sorry, these books are a little overdue. <laughs>